most people with ApoE4 only hear about the risk. But what if your gene also holds the key to preventing Alzheimer's? This new research changes everything. I'm Dr. Kevin Tran, the founder of the Phoenix Committee. And if you carry ApoE4, this video is for you. Today, we're diving into some of the most exciting findings from the Alzheimer's Association International Conference, or AAIC, on ApoE and lipid biology, which took place in March 2025. You'll hear how rare ApoE mutations are showing us exactly how to stop Alzheimer's before it starts by blocking amyloid, suppressing tau, and fixing the fat processing systems in the brain. These aren't just lab curiosities, they are blueprints for real-world prevention, and we're going to break each one down step by step. Most of the headlines about APOE focus on APOE4 and the risk it carries, especially for Alzheimer's. But there is a quieter story unfolding on the opposite end of the spectrum. What if certain mutations in APOE don't just fail to increase your risk, but actually protect you? That's the question Dr. Holtzman brings into the spotlight. And as he puts it, this area is still vastly underexplored. Are there converging mechanisms underlying protective APOE variants? And I think this is one area in the field that has really not been studied uh, adequately, in my opinion. He's right. In the race to understand the danger of APOE4, we've overlooked the clues hidden in protective variants. These rare versions of the gene might hold the blueprint to reverse engineer resilience, if we understand how they protect the brain. We might be able to mimic those effects even in people who carry APOE4. Obviously, the, the elephant in the room regarding this is APOE2, but you'll hear more about hemizygous uh, APOE4 knockout in people from Michael Beloy, um, the APOE3 Christchurch variant, and then the APOE4 R251G, which was recently described as well as the APOE3 V236E, or Jacksonville variant. So let's break this down. We've got APOE2. That's the most well-known protective variant long associated with reduced Alzheimer's risk. Then there's Chris Church, a mutation in APOE3 that helped one woman avoid Alzheimer's even with a deadly genetic mutation for early onset Alzheimer's. That's not just rare, it's historic. We also have Jacksonville, a subtle tweak in the tail end of the protein and R251G, so that one doesn't have a name somehow, it's a variant on the APOE4 background that seems to offset some of its toxicity. Here is what's remarkable. These variants aren't clustered in one spot. They're scattered across the gene. That tells us they are not all working the same way. Some are changing how APOE binds to fats, some are changing how it interacts with brain cells, and others might be altering inflammation or protein clearance. In other words, there's no single path to protection. But that's good news. It means there are multiple ways to interfere with Alzheimer's development, and the more we understand them, the more doors we can open. So if you carry ApoE4, this changes the question from, am I doomed, to what can we borrow from the brain's own defense? This is the frontier. Understanding not just what goes wrong, but what goes right in the brains that resist Alzheimer's against all odds. All right, let's talk about the most famous Alzheimer's resistance gene, APOE2. If APOE4 is like stepping on the gas pedal for Alzheimer's, APOE2 is more like hitting the brakes, and the main mechanism is all about stopping amyloid before it starts. While there may be other things that APOE2 does, its protective effect likely, in my view, is related to um, how it suppresses amyloid deposition. Let's unpack that. Amyloid beta is a protein fragment your brain makes naturally. Normally, it gets cleared away like garbage on a daily street sweep. But when that system breaks down, whether because of aging, inflammation, or genetic factors, it then starts to clump together into sticky plaques. And these plaques aren't just debris. They disrupt cell-to-cell -cell communication, trigger inflammation, and damage blood vessels. Over time, they choke your brain's ability to function. Now, here's where APOE comes in. Think of APOE as the garbage truck. I always love this analogy, and I feel like I always use this in my video, but it's really supposed to help transport amyloid out of the brain. But not all the trucks are built the same. APOE4 is like a rusty, unreliable truck. It often stalls, drops debris, and can even make things worse. APOE2, on the other hand, is like an ultra-efficient cleanup crew. Either it prevents the production of excess amyloid, or it clears it so effectively that plaques barely get any chance to form. And that's not just theory. If you look at the effect of removing APOE in this amyloid model, you can see that there's like 
very, very little A beta deposition, no cerebral amyloid angiopathy that forms. And so APOE2 uh, appears in the model systems to also have a very similar phenotype as what you see in humans that do or don't develop amyloidosis, that you see a much, much lower level of amyloid. This is a powerful finding. When scientists completely remove APOE in Alzheimer's mouse models, amyloid doesn't build up. It's as if the system loses the signal to accumulate plaques at all. And remarkably, APOE2 produces a similar effect. It doesn't just fail to cause amyloid buildup, it seems to actively block it. So what does that mean for us? Well, if APOE2 naturally turns off the amyloid trap, the goal for future therapies might be to mimic APOE2 function, either by adjusting how APOE binds to amyloid, enhancing clearance, or altering lipid signaling that modulates production. And for APOE4 carriers like me, this is hopeful because it means our risk isn't just about what's broken, but it's about what's missing. And with the right insights, we might be able to restore those protective functions. Now let's talk about one of the most remarkable Alzheimer's cases in modern science and the variant behind it, Chris Church. This gene mutation made headline because of one extraordinary woman in Colombia. She carried the rare mutation in the PSEN1 gene, which under normal circumstances causes Alzheimer's in your 40s. Her brain was full of amyloid plaques by midlife, just like every other carrier. But something astonishing happened. She didn't get symptoms until nearly 30 years later than expected. Her cognition stayed intact, while others with the same mutation had long succumbed to the disease. So what was different? She carried two copies of a rare APOE3 Christchurch variant, and that might have made all the difference. It really looks like the main effect is blocking, at least in this model system, amyloid-induced tauopathy. Let's break that down. Amyloid plaques might start the fire, but it's tau protein tangles that burn through the brain. Tau is a structural protein inside neurons. When it becomes misfolded or hyperphosphorylated, it forms tangles that disrupt the cell's internal transport system. Even worse, tau pathology tends to spread jumping from one neuron to the next like a virus on a forest fire. This progression, called tau-pathy, is what correlates more closely with actual cognitive decline. Now here's the stunning insight. Chris Church seems to stop that spread. Even if the brain is already full of plaques, this variant blocks the domino effect of tau, keeping neurons intact and preserving function. The APOE uh, Christchurch variant strongly suppresses tau-mediated neurodegeneration that you see in this model system of uh, primary tauopathy. And that, that uh, is also something that, at least in our hands, we don't see that s significant neuroprotection like that in the presence of APOE2. This is a critical distinction. While APOE2 seems to keep the fire from ever starting by preventing amyloid buildup, Chris Church acts like a fire break. It may not stop amyloid from forming, but it blocks tau from running wild. So what does this mean for future therapies? It tells us there are multiple layers of defense. One against the buildup of harmful proteins like amyloid, and another against the downstream damage caused by tau. And Chris Church gives us a living proof of concept. Even with plaques, we might be able to delay symptoms by targeting tau pathways. So for APOE4 carriers, that's a big deal because our version of the gene tends to accelerate both amyloid and tau damage. But Chris Church teaches us that even if the first domino falls, the whole chain doesn't have to collapse. When we talk about APOE variants, it may sound like they're just minor tweaks in the same place. But here's the kicker. They're not. These protective versions of APOE, well, they're scattered across completely different parts of the protein. That turns out to be crucial. And you can see that the location of these coding uh, variants uh, is different. I mean, some of them are in the N-terminal domain, some in the receptor binding regions, and then two of the more recent ones are in the C-terminal domains. Here's why that matters. APOE isn't just one blob doing one job. It's a multi-tool. Picture it like a Swiss army knife with two main compartments. One, the N-terminal domain handles binding to receptors, like the LDL receptors that shuttle cholesterol and other lipids around. Then you have the C-terminal domain, helps with lipid binding, essentially packaging and delivering fats where they need to go. Now imagine if you slightly alter the blade versus the screwdriver, they'd affect totally different function. That's what we're seeing here. Each protective variant affects a different tool in the kit. Chris Church alters the N-terminal, possibly changing how APOE binds to cellular receptors or tau. Jacksonville affects the C-terminal, modifying lipid interactions or preventing 
toxic aggregation. APOE2 changes the way APOE docks with receptors involved in amyloid clearance. What's powerful here is the precision. These variants don't just blunt the entire APOE function, they surgically tweak specific aspects. Some block amyloid, others block tau, and some may rewire lipid handling or reduce inflammation. And that gives researchers something to work with. Instead of trying to silence APOE completely, which comes with major side effects, we may be able to edit or mimic specific regions of the protein. The goal? Preserve the helpful part while cutting out the harmful ones. In other words, these mutations aren't just natural accidents, they're blueprints, each revealing what part of APOE we need to target for future therapies. Finally, let's explore lesser known but highly promising mutation, the Jacksonville variant, also called V236E. It may not have been making headlines like Chris Church or APOE2, but what it does show is that under the hood could be game-changing. The Jacksonville uh, presence of that variant tends to result in the APOE being less um, aggregated. Um, and also, the Jacksonville variant is associated with greater lipid uh, association with the variant. Let's decode that. This mutation does three critical things. One, it reduces amyloid buildup. Two, it helps APOE bind better to fats. And three, it prevents APOE from clumping into toxic aggregates. Here's why that's a big deal, especially for APOE for carriers. So APOE is supposed to be your brain's lipid delivery truck, right? Remember, it shuttles your fats, cholesterol to neurons and glial cells. But in APOE4, this system gets jammed. The truck breaks down, lipids pile up in the wrong place, and the protein itself starts to stick together, forming harmful blobs. So the Jacksonville variant, it seems to clear that specific jam. By improving lipid binding, Jacksonville makes APOE a better transporter. That means astrocytes and microglia, the support cells that handle repair, cleanup, and inflammation that we covered deeply into another video, can function properly again. It also means less sticky APOE floating around, which could otherwise trigger immune response or further aggregation. It's like fixing both the road and the delivery truck at once, restoring flow in a brain system that thrives on balance. And for those of us with APOE4, this is a type of intervention we need, one that doesn't just treat symptoms but helps restore the original design of how APOE should work. The Jacksonville variant offers a natural proof of concept that better lipid transport, even in a toxic environment, can slow down or maybe even prevent Alzheimer's processes from taking hold. Let me make a quick pause here. If this breakdown helps you make sense of APOE for science, tap the subscribe button so you won't miss the next Phoenix Deep Dive. We're just getting started, and there's so much more to come. The future is precision prevention. Here's the most important insight from all of this session. We're not looking at one protective variant or one protective pathways. We're looking at a portfolio of defenses, each acting on a different part of the disease process. APOE2 and A3, V236E, and decreasing APOE levels definitely decrease A-beta deposition in, in model systems, and, and certainly in some, there's some evidence in humans that's the case. Uh, and while the cellular molecular mechanisms are worked out, the Christchurch variant decreases amyloid-induced tauopathy and tau-mediated neurodegeneration in animal systems. Let's recap what we know. One, APOE2 helps block the buildup of amyloid plaques before they even start. Two, Chris Church steps in later, even after plaques form, and stops the spread of toxic tau. Three, Jacksonville improves lipid transport and reduces protein clumping, possibly restoring cellular function across support cell. They are not overlapping effects. They are layered like a defense system. One intercepts the threat. One blocks the damage. One keeps the infrastructure running smoothly. And that leads to the real takeaway. We need to better understand the cellular, molecular, and biochemical underpinnings of these protective effects to assist really in developing novel therapeutic strategies targeting APOE, because it may be that one size doesn't fit all in further development of therapeutics around this. Exactly. A single drug or generic lifestyle protocol won't cut it. We need precision prevention. Strategies that reflect your unique biology, your unique genetics, your risk profile, and also your environment, your habits, and your preferences. So some future therapies might mimic APOE2 plaques clearing efficiency. 
Others might block tau like Chris Church. And some could be lipid tuning agents that restore balance to the cellular environment, like what we see in Jacksonville. This is where Alzheimer's research is heading, not towards a miracle cure, but toward personalized stacks of intervention, informed by the people who are already beating the odds, not because of the interventions they do, but just because they won the genetic lottery on that specific gene. And for APOE for carriers, this is a message of hope, because it means our genes don't just predict risk, they can inspire on the roadmap to prevention. At least, maybe not our gene, but the gene of uh, the people who carry these protective genes. Remember, all of that means your gene is not your fate. Across these six insights we covered in this video, we saw something extraordinary. One, APOE2 prevents amyloid from ever building up. Two, Chris Church, stop tau from spreading even when plaques are already present. Three, Jacksonville repairs lipid transport and reduces toxic protein clumping. Each variant targets a different part of the APOE protein, proving there's no single path to protection. Together, they show us that Alzheimer's doesn't have one root cause and won't have one silver bullet solution. The future is in precision prevention, stacking intervention, mimicking protective pathways, and tailoring them to your biology. So this is exactly what we do inside the Phoenix community. We help you build your own personalized prevention protocol by looking at your genes, your environment, your habits, to prepare that list of interventions that will work for you. Because everyone is unique and there's no one size fits all answer. So some of these protocols might support your brain lipid balance, might reduce your inflammation, it might re improve your amyloid clearance, and the most important part is tracking all these changes through a very user-friendly app where basically you can track if each intervention is actually moving the needle for you or not. Because the worst thing you can do is to follow an intervention daily for the rest of your life without knowing if it works or not. Imagine how difficult it would be if you don't know if what you are doing with a lot of effort is working or not. And the easiest way to do that is to look at the people who share similar health profile to you, so same genetics, habit, environment, and look at what works for them. Because when you see what works for this cluster of people that are similar, it has a higher chance to work for the other people in that cluster. And again, that's the whole big data part of the Phoenix community, and that's why we want to have as many APOE4 joining us as possible, because the more data we generate all together, the better answer we get for each one of us. So if you are interested in joining, you get all the details in the description below where you can apply to join the Phoenix community. I review all applications myself, so pardon me if it takes a few days because we usually get a lot of application as soon as the video hits YouTube, but just mention that you're coming from YouTube and I'll make sure to show you some extra love. All right, that's it for today. I hope to see you in the next video and have a great day.